again, welcome to part two of Retrofitting International Tax Structures for U.S. and Global Tax Reform. Um, this is Bruce Stelsner speaking. I'll be your host for this session. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with us, uh, Tom Zolo, who's a national tax partner, uh, principal in international tax, uh, Mark Martin in transfer pricing, national tax, who's involved in a lot of controversy, and uh, Case Van Meel, uh, who is a seconded Dutch tax partner, and Case leads our um, international tax team, uh, and he is based out of New York. Um, so this is a foundations course, and again, it's part two. Uh, it's what I would refer to for those fan folks that are fans of Marvell as an origin story. Um, you'll have modules which follow this, which speak to um, the specifics of what we've addressed in this introductory session. Uh, this is a dated presentation and everything that's printed is dated. Uh, this is February 26, 2021. So this is our views and input as of this date. You should also always check with your sources and subject matter experts to get the most current matters. And then lastly, when possible, put your slide deck on pause so you could absorb some of the structures that we're going through because we, we will hit this fairly quickly. Um, on the learning objectives, uh, we're going to continue on in what we've hit in the past. Uh, previously, we covered drivers of change, uh, ATED 1 and 2, U.S. tax reform, and the multilateral instruments and their impact um, on multinationals. In this session, you know, the learning objectives are to understand Pillar 1 and 2, which Tom and Mark will cover. Dempi and Siga, uh, which Tom and Mark will cover, and then as well identifying uh, structures out there that are subject to um, potential retrofitting and, and, and potentially what some of those uh, solutions and mitigations could be. So this is the agenda. Uh, we're going to start at uh, part two at OECD Blueprints, Pillar 1 and 2 and cover, as I said, Dempi, Siga. We'll hit the new world order structures and issues uh, for U.S. multinationals and foreign parented company structures. We'll do it briefly because Tom hit that in quite a bit of detail um, in uh, part one. Uh, we'll have retrofitting examples, as I indicated, and then we'll have some time um, for the wrap-up session. We'll go over drivers of change fairly quickly here because again, we covered it in part one, but there's been a significant quantum of change as you can see from this slide. This is really from 015 forward from the issuance of the back BEPS action items uh, one through 15 and the BEPS 1.0 report um, that we've moved on in quite an accelerated pace, uh, frankly, from 17 forward. Um, and, and you know, as as we look at this and we look at the change, uh, we're we're kind of in an inverted place from where we were pre-tax reform in the U.S. as well as uh, the structures and subject to exposure and and the new rules that are out there. What companies are considering is um, how the new drivers of change affect their legacy structures, um, what the value chain is that they have, and how it may be impacted through these uh, reforms, and then how do they address it going forward. Um, the key drivers here, or the theories or, or focus areas uh, driving the change has been a, a legacy planning, which has created a, a mismatch of income and deductions across borders. Uh, so what have we seen as far as drivers of change to impact that? Um, well, you have the U.S. anti-hybrid legislation, you know, largely 267 Cap A and 245 Cap A E that talk to hybrid instruments, uh, both debt and equity. You also have ATAD2, uh, which gets into hybridity in quite a bit of detail. Uh, that's attacking mismatch of income. Transfer pricing and base erosion, we're trying to shift income to lower jurisdictions, lower taxing jurisdictions. We'll hit that on all fours today, talking about DEMPI and SEGA. And then the other piece that's out there is ATAD1 and, and, and the, um, the limitations on base stripping through interest deductions, which we see in the 163J environment and other jurisdictions have implemented similar rules. And lastly, jurisdiction to tax and business nexus and PE. That's really hit in a big way in the multilateral instruments uh, provisions. And then as well as Tom will cover um, pillar one and two. Uh, 
in, in, in their attempt to move more of a quote unquote fair share of taxation to the source jurisdictions. Before we even had this tax reform, as we all know, tax departments were typically limited as to resources. Now we have a quantum of change and the speed of change that is happening, which is surprising everybody. Uh, so we already have limited resources. The quantum of speed has, has increased significantly. It used to be just US tax reform that folks had to worry about. Now it's everywhere. And we live in a COVID world, which exasperates these issues. And, and, and the heads of tax are, are looking to uh, determine how they address this and look for more long-term sustainable structures. So that's why we're here, is to make sure everybody's level set as the issues and what are the types of mitigations we can consider after consultation with our you know, subject matter experts. The next section of the presentation deals with BEPS 2.0 the OECD blueprints on pillar one and pillar two. Unlike the rest of this presentation, this portion is being recorded on January 14th, 2022. It was updated because two significant developments occurred since February of 2021. First in October, the OECD put out a position paper that confirmed certain key aspects of the operation of pillar one. And second, on December 20th, 2021, the OECD published model legislation on Pillar 2's income inclusion rule and its backstop, the undertaxed payment rule. Also, on December 22nd, the EU published its proposed directive on the same topics. The scope of Pillar 1, well, it was confirmed. First, uh, in scope multinational enterprises with a turnover of above 20 billion and profitability above 10% are within the scope of Pillar 1. So that's quite a high threshold initially. It's intended to capture fewer than 100 multinational enterprises. Um, that threshold will be reduced after seven years, assuming that it operates in an administratively reasonable manner to companies that have turnover of at least 10 billion euros. Also, the October statement confirmed that extractives and regulated financial services companies are excluded. Other key developments in particular are that the amount that would be subject to reallocation under Pillar 1 would equal 25% of the residual profits of the enterprise in excess of the 10% operating profit threshold. And the quid pro quo for the adoption of Pillar 1 would be that unilateral measures, that is digital service taxes, would have to be removed once implementation is achieved. For Pillar 2, the threshold for being subject to it is much lower. It's 750 million euros, which is the same as the country by country reporting threshold. And the new key developments is that the minimum tax rate that would be set under Pillar 2 is at 15%. That is the rate that will apply to the income inclusion rule and its backstop, the uh, undertax payment rule. The, the tax rate that would apply to uh, low tax payments that would be subject to tax rule, which would deny treaty benefits, is set at 9%. Some other of the developments are listed here below. In particular, there is going to be a five-year exemption for multinationals that are in the initial phase of their international activity. And as we'll discuss a little bit more later, in general, while the Pillar 2 income inclusion rule would come into effect in 2023, the undertax payment rule would have a one-year delay and would come into force in 2024. This slide illustrates how Pillar 1 would work. So here we have P Company that operates in its home country, Country 1, and it sells into two other countries, Country 2, where it has uh, a subsidiary or an affiliate, QCO, that provides in-country marketing support and also sells via the internet into country three, so it makes remote sales. Amount A, which is the tax that would uh, reallocate 25% uh, of the excess over the 10% operating margin, applies to remote sales. So in this case, PICO, if it meets the thresholds for application, would be subject to that potential reallocation on its remote sales into both country two and country three. 
With respect to amount B, which is an amount under Pillar 1 that largely has had its development kind of fall by the wayside, that there would, in addition, for sales that are made and supported by a local affiliate, be a presumed profit margin that ought to be recorded on those sales. So to the extent that QCO itself is not meeting that threshold and what's being uh, reported locally, PICO could be subject to additional tax on those sales where it has an affiliate supporting its activities. Okay, Pillar 2 and its blueprint as it came out in October. Now, again, although Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 initially were supposed to advance in lockstep, in, in fact, that hasn't happened. Pillar 2 has gotten out ahead of Pillar 1, and within Pillar 1, uh, the definition of the amount A has gotten out in front of amount B. So at least at present, we have a much clearer view of where we're going with Pillar 2. So I'm going to start on the right-hand side because what was released in December dealt directly with the income inclusion rule and its backstop, the undertax payment rule. So the income inclusion rule and what is called the switchover rule, which applies to branches, in the model legislation would trigger an inclusion at a shareholder level to the extent that the earnings in any foreign country, and you go on a country by country basis, didn't rise to the level of the 15% minimum tax that's been agreed. And the way the income inclusion rule would work is you'd first group all of the activities of the group that are in a particular country. You do a tax rate determination. If it's under 15%, then um, the difference, the profits uh, or the tax that would be imposed to get you up to 15%, would be subject to the income inclusion rule. And the income inclusion rule would apply on a top-down basis. So the ultimate parent company would have first right to impose the top-up tax. If it didn't, the next company in the chain would apply the tax and, and so on. To the extent that the income inclusion rule does not top up all the taxes that were not subject to tax at the minimum rate, then the under tax payment rule would kick in. And uh, the slide here says that the top-up tax would be collected by denying a deduction. In fact, the way that this has evolved, you wouldn't actually have to have a payment from a country to the low-tax country for it to have a deduction disallowed under the under-tax payment rule. Instead, as this concept has evolved, the under-tax payment rule actually prorates the amount of profits that haven't been subject to tax at the appropriate rate and has a formula where it allocates out the deductions that need to be disallowed to the group members based upon um, a fraction that takes into account both the headcount in the country versus the worldwide headcount and uh, tangible assets that are within the country. So it, it's evolved from actually looking at payments that are going to the low tax affiliate and, and simply allocates out the deductions to the other group members. Now, one of the questions under the income inclusion rule is whether guilty qualifies for the income inclusion rule. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in later slides. But the basic feeling, and certainly this is borne out by the draft directive in the EU, is that our current guilty regime does not qualify. And it doesn't qualify because it doesn't operate on a country by country basis. Instead, you have a blending of foreign tax rates. In addition, the current tax rate, 13 and eight percent or 10 and a half, depending upon how you look at it, under the guilty regime is not equal to the 15% threshold that's been set under Pillar 2. The subject to tax rule is not covered by the December OECD paper, but the subject to tax rule applies before the rules that I just described, the IIR and the under tax payment rule. And what it will do is to deny treaty benefits for intragroup payments that have been subject to tax at a low rate. And for this purpose, the low rate is a 9% rate. And the subject to tax rule would be put into effect via a multilateral instrument. Okay, highlights from the December 2021 model rules that came out in December. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the income inclusion rule, the target effective date is 2023. The fact that the EU moved just two days after the OECD paper came out, shows that they are serious about meeting this 2023 standard. Uh, the under tax payment rule, as I said earlier, would be delayed until 2024. You know, one question is, well, what is left open? 
the basic form of the rules is really uh, no longer left open as far as the OECD is concerned. The key features of Pillar 2, or at least the income inclusion rule and intertax payment rule, are pretty well set. And what's kind of left open for additional public consultation are administrative aspects of the implementation of the rules. So what's coming next? Several documents are going to be released next year. 2022 is going going to be a very busy year for additional activity on both Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. First of all, commentary on the model rules is expected to come out either later in January of 2022 or in early February. There's a draft that's underway that's already a 200-page document. And this commentary is going to be very important because for people who have looked at the draft legislation, it's like reading a dictionary. In fact, out of the 70 pages in the draft legislation, approximately 10 of those pages are just definitions. And as you read through the operative provisions, they rely very heavily on the definitions. So it's clearly not an easy read. As I said before, there are going to be public consultations on administrative aspects of the model rules, uh, but I would not expect any changes in the substantive rules themselves. And there still needs to be work done on the subject of tax rule. We expect there to be a model treaty provision, so an MLI provision, that would come out along with commentary sometime in the first half of 2022. What is the impact of this on U.S.-based multinationals? Let's start with the left-hand side. Assuming guilty is treated as a qualified income inclusion rule, and as I said, current guilty probably is not, but the version that was included in the Build Back Better Act likely is qualified. So as we sit here today, we don't know what's going to happen with those provisions. If there is tax legislation, it is probably pretty likely that it would pick up the international provisions of the failed Build Back Better Act and we would come up with a guilty regime that does work country by country. So that's really what we're talking about here on the left-hand side. So, you know, you might think, well, in that case, we really have nothing to worry about because we're compliant. And that's not quite right. You know, one of the things that can happen is that the United States itself could be a low tax jurisdiction. How could that happen? It could happen because, well, our tax rate is based on tax accounting, you determine the effective tax rate for purposes of the income inclusion rule based upon, in general, GAAP, although subject to you know many, many exceptions. So the United States could still be low taxed. Also, the undertax payment rule could allocate to the United States some deductions that need to be disallowed. So that's another way that it could operate. And then we have the question of what would happen with the subject to tax rule. Could there be related party payments that don't meet the 9% threshold that the United States would then be expected to disallow as deductions under this multilateral instrument? And then finally, we have to think about the administrative requirements for compliance and what changes you know, that would require. If guilty is not treated as a qualified income inclusion rule, which would likely happen if we did not amend the guilty rules to go to a country by country. We still have all the problems that I just described on the left, but you also run into the issue that in that case, what the uh, income inclusion rule would tell you is that the next company down the chain for US-based multinational ought to itself apply the income inclusion rule and apply a top-up. So we could have the simultaneous application of our guilty rules and the income inclusion rule uh, by a first-year subsidiary. And that raises the question, which rule would apply first? Since the country of the first-year subsidiary likely would apply the income inclusion rule, that may, in fact, top up the tax and could eliminate the U.S. tax. Alternatively, you know, you might have simultaneous application of the two rules in a way that would leave some rule for uh, the guilty rules to apply and uh, some tax that's being picked up by the first year subsidiary. So, you know, th there is a lot here that provides an incentive for the United States to adopt the guilty amendments that were included in Build Back Better. Otherwise, it may be ceding taxing rights to uh, one of its subsidiary holding companies rather than taking that tax itself. Okay, so here's a pillar two example. And in this case, we have a company, P Company, that earns residual profit on its sales in France, where Q retains a distributor margin. 
And in addition, there are stripping payments that go out from PICO and from the U.S. parent into Singapore, which may be offshore payments. So how would Pillar 2 apply? Well, first, you'd have to look at Q Company and ask, what is the effective rate that France is applying? Now, based on the statutory rate in France, you'd think, well, no problem. However, you know, as I said earlier, we're not applying local tax accounting. What we start out with is applying book tax, including deferreds, over book income. Now, having said that, that's generally what we do. When you look at the model legislation, there are about half a dozen adjustments that get made to the tax liability. There are also 15 or so adjustments that get made to the denominator, the income. Some of those are mandatory, some are elective. And and so you really have kind of a whole different computation from either what France looks at from a local tax perspective or what may have been reported under U.S. GAAP, for example. There also are rules that deal with situations, since we're going to use in general GAAP accounting for the numerator, what happens if the deferred taxes are not paid within a particular period? You know, there may be the need to go back and file amended returns. So, you know, a very complex computation in determining whether QCO in France has met the 15%. With respect to the payments that are going out to Singapore, if those are being paid into a Singapore offshore regime, Singapore is not imposing any tax. So the effective tax rate on the interest payments from PICO and U.S. parent would be 0%. 0% is less than nine. That means that under the subject to tax rule, no deduction would be allowed either in the Netherlands or in the U.S. for those outbound interest payments. This lists the activities going forward. And as I said, you know, this is going to be a very busy year. So I'm just going to start with December, where the OECD released the model globe rules. Those came out on December 20th. As I mentioned earlier, the EU put out a draft directive two days later, December 22nd, uh, that largely followed the OECD model rules. Assuming that this all moves forward, the pillar one amount is intended to come into effect in 2023, as is the income inclusion rule and the subject to tax rule under pillar two. As I mentioned a couple times earlier, the undertakes payment rule would be delayed until 2024. Now, from a technical track standpoint, there's a whole lot that's going to go on. As I said earlier, there's going to be an explanation that will come out on the model legislation. We expect that to come out in the next month or so. There has to be work done on the multilateral instrument that would implement the subject to tax rule. That's expected around mid-year. There's additional work to be done under Pillar 1 on Amount A. And then finally, you know, the laggard in all of this is what Amount B is going to look like. So remember, Amount B, unlike Amount A under Pillar 1, is the amount that would apply a normalized operating margin in each country where a multinational sells where it does have some kind of local sales affiliate or a customer relationship entity that's rendering some services. And what they would do is it it would bring up, you know, particularly in the case of uh, stripped risk, low margin distributors, the amount that's being reported locally by having the other group entities be obligated to pay an additional amount. Now, what's not clear under amount B is exactly how broad it's going to be. It could be so broad that it applies to all market countries and basically implies a certain expected distributor margin. On the other hand, uh, the OECD has indicated that the focus of amount B is primarily on developing countries. So there's a lot of ambiguity about the scope of amount B, its reach. It could be quite broad. It could apply to many consumer and industrial companies, or it may get scaled back and have relatively limited effect you know, largely to sales and into developing countries that are the market countries. Okay, this is the last slide in this portion of the presentation, and it just lists uh, the expectations for what are going on. And, you know, I've described a lot of those. There's a lot of work that's going to be done on Pillar 1. We're going to see documents out on Amount A, which has moved out ahead. It's going to put a lot more meat on the bones as to how the amount potentially subject to reallocation would be allocated, how losses would be carried forward and offset the amount that is uh, available for reallocation. It would deal with a marketing and distribution profit safe harbor. It would have to deal with the administrative certainty, and it would have to further define uh, the excluded industries. So 
you know, there's a lot that needs to be done in amount A. But having said that, there's a lot more that needs to be done for amount B. There's going to be a public consultation document issued sometime in mid-2020 that will give us the first idea about how broadly amount B is likely to apply. And then that will be followed up with more concrete proposals later in 2022. But the plan, you know, is to get both parts of pillar one, so both amount A and amount B, uh, back on track so that 2023 would be, in general, the implementation date for the bulk of BEPS 2.0. The only exception at this point being the delay in the undertakes payment rule out into 2024. So that's where we stand right now. Keep an eye out. These rules are, are certain to change, and they're going to change very quickly as we get closer to that January 1st, 2023 expected implementation date. So, Mark, let's move on to the uh, final of our drivers of change, Dumpy and Sega. Okay. Thank you, Tom. So, in two, as Bruce mentioned, in 2015, the OECD promulgated revised transfer pricing guidelines that address the allocation of profits arising from the exploitation of intangibles. And those rules make it clear that mere legal ownership of an intangible does not entitle the owner to any intangible related returns. In addition, those rules provide that contractual ownership and funding of intangible development only entitle the owner to a risk adjusted return on their investment. So the rules, you know, rather than focusing on exclusively on legal ownership and, fun and funding, the rules put an emphasis on functional activities associated with the intangibles. And specifically, those rules focus on what we call DEMPI, development, enhancement, maintenance, protection, and exploitation activities that are associated with the intangibles. And many have uh, intangible property structures that are significantly impacted by, by these rules. And you know, we need to make sure that, the, that those structures are compliant with DEMPI concepts. The, the guidelines provide that when allocating returns from intangibles, members of a multinational enterprise should receive appropriate compensation for any functions that they perform, assets that they use, and risks that they assume in connection with these DEMPI activities. And as a result of these rules, it's necessary to determine you know, by the means of a, a factual development, a functional analysis, you know, which members of the group perform and exercise control over those DEMPI functions. And this, this slide is, is, you know, graphically depicts the points that I just made on the previous slides, uh, specifically that material and tangible related returns can only be earned by entities that carry out DEMPI functions. It's also important to note that although our U.S. Treasury regulations don't directly uh, incorporate the concept of DEMPI, they do provide that uh, for allocation of profit to be respected, the conduct of the parties must align with their contractual arrangements, including operational control over the intangibles and the ability to incur risks associated with the intangibles. And you know, recently these principles were reaffirmed in the Coca-Cola case, where the court declined to accept the taxpayer's allocation of, of significant profits to entities that were primarily engaged in routine manufacturing activities. The, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the DEMPI rules were promulgated in 2015, but it takes time for controversies to work their way through the system. However, we are seeing DEMPI-inspired audits popping up across the globe, and in particular in Europe. And you know, that, and also in light of the Coke case, uh, it's very important to um, evaluate the DEMPI and potentially establishing or buttressing DEMPI, particularly related to legacy IP holding company structures. To do that means to have you know, contractual arrangements that are consistent with their overall transfer pricing policy and the functional activities of the parties need to align with those contractual arrangements. In addition, the, the governance activities, including the composition of the board of directors of the IP entity should also be consistent with and you know, should substantiate the desired uh, transfer pricing outcomes. 
So, Tom, I don't know if you have any thoughts to add on Dempy, and if not, I think we can move to the SEGA topic. Okay, thank you, Mark. Well, SEGA is related to Dempy. However, you know, one might view it as a much more extreme um, form of substance that's required uh, for countries to satisfy. And essentially, this uh, concept arose from a desire by the OECD and the EU to um, put out of existence tax haven operations um, where there wasn't the re requisite substance to support the income that had been allocated to them. So the first shot at the tax havens was in October 2017 when the EU Code of Conduct Group issued a list of non-cooperative countries that were engaged in harmful tax practices. Essentially, uh, no or very low tax countries where um, profits could be moved with a minimum amount of substance. Uh, the next year, in November of 2018, the OECD Forum on Harmful Tax Practices issued a paper that created this concept of SEGA, which is that uh, tax haven and you know, very low tax countries um, have to require their companies to perform locally the core income generating activities that are associated with particular activities in order to be entitled to the profits resulting from those activities. And um, under the SEGA concept, countries are required to collect and exchange information that explains um, where the SEGA is performed and the income is generated. And non-compliant companies would be forced uh, to pay penalties and then after a period of years would have to be struck from the corporate charters. Well, very quickly, um, the tax havens and low tax uh, countries adopted economic substance legislation that was largely in line with the OECD's requirements. Uh, those countries include Bermuda, the Cayman Islands, Barbados, and the Channel Islands. And so this uh, economic substance legislation has been in effect since 2019. Uh, the basics on SEGA is that the locally performed activities have to be appropriate for the relevant um, function of, of the uh, entity. So if we're talking about holding company acti uh, activities and profits or even financing, you might expect that those local activities would be relatively low. In the case of uh, IP holding companies, though, they're, they're really going to be extremely difficult, if not impossible, for most um, companies to satisfy, because those would require that through employees, core income generating activities be performed in the tax haven and not contracted out in bulk to affiliates. Okay, I'll pick it up from here. Um, this will be a quick run through the new world order and structures required in retrofitting because we hit this in more detail uh, in part one. Uh, but just, just a couple of ways of looking at what Tom uh, and Mark went over just a, a minute ago. Um, you know, SEGA requires that the individuals turn the screw uh, in the tax haven. Uh, DEMPI requires that you have oversight, hire, fire, capital investment decisions associated with those folks turning the screw. But you don't need to be there turning the screw. So it's, it's, as Tom indicated, it's the end of IP, uh, IP codes and havens. Um, so rather quickly going through this, um, I won't spend much time. This is going to be a place where you probably want to pause uh, the presentation, but this is t the typical legacy structure that multinationals have had and have frankly built over the last 40 years. Um, they can be quite complicated. They drove significant benefits in the past, uh, but they're subject to you know, uh, vulnerabilities or they simply don't work uh, or they're harmful. So kind of quickly going through down, top down, left to right, uh, your first foreign hold co is an example of a basis aggregator or a Falkoff structure. That's a really bad thing these days because we're going to allocate interest expense and stewardship expense to that high basis. And it's going to be a grind on, on getting your foreign tax credit. And in the guilty environment, we have a use it or lose it concept. And um, so and any lost FTC is going forever and guilty. Uh, foreign hold co two may be set up for treaty purposes, routing payments, et cetera. Uh, so it's going to be exposed uh, to the principal purpose test uh, in the multilateral treaty instruments and, and whether they should get the benefit of um, uh, treaty rates. Uh, 
Uh, and so companies with multi hold co structures for treaty purposes probably don't have the board meetings and the, the DEMPI functions required to meet um, the treaty uh, applications. FINCOs, as we know, 163J, 267 CAP A, ATAD 2, anti uh, hybrid equity rules and 245 CAP A. And Tom and Mark just went through our DEMPI discussion with IP principal companies, which simply uh, is not going to work. And then, of course, the most of the management associated with all those profits going to principal is sitting in CFC Opco. So country X might want a profit split or a higher allocation of profits. It's jurisdiction because that's where the dumpy functions are going. And then high tax CFCs and splitters, et cetera, it just doesn't work. It's not applicable. We've got a guilty blending structure. Um, and then a check DRE below for purposes of mitigating subpart F. Frankly, subpart F is the cure for guilty in not one size fits all. And everybody, every company needs to look at their structure and determine how they customize the various attributes and triggers to make sure they've optimized the, the tax efficiency of the structures. Here's the stuff that doesn't work. This is just a sample. We've covered a lot of this stuff, but if you look to the right, offshore Makila structures and CBTs, which effectively have nowhere income, um, that's exposed right now. Most especially Makila's have a much shorter life uh, than CBTs because that's where the focus is in ATAD2. Uh, just going down the line with CVBB structures, not in the context of IPCOs, but there's a lot of financing structures out there. And then uh, Lux, U.S. finance branch, Swiss, U.S. finance branches, where we have a very or no limited substance and are trying to argue that we have a, um, a, a branch in the U.S. that's not subject to U.S. tax and we've got nowhere income again that's going to run afoul of the anti-tax avoidance directives. Similar to um, you know, U.S. multinationals, foreign parented structures are going to have the same issues. Uh, just kind of, again, going left to right, you know, when you made acquisitions, you try and did out from under structures or break the CFC hold co structure. So, you know, you don't have subpart F. Well, we've repealed 958B4, so now we've got attribution up and down the chain. Uh, so even if you were to put in an equity investment directly from foreign parent into foreign sub of USP in a sandwich structure, it's not going to get you out of the CFC rules. Um, the financing structures, again, are subject to the U.S. Um, 267 Cap A issues, which we'll hit here in a moment, and Case will cover some more. Um, but again, um, you also have the, the, the financing branches, which we spoke to, uh, which are subject to um, ATAD2 and, and nowhere income. Uh, apart from all that, you've got B, you have 163J. Uh, and so just like U.S. parented structures, um, foreign parented structures need to be reviewed uh, and retrofitted to something that's more sustainable and get maybe a replacement structure. Case, did you want to hit this? You, you, everybody may remember from part one, right, the, um, the anti-hybrid provisions and, and the, the steps are being taken. And so everybody is looking for alternatives where there's no hybrid structure. And, and this is one, one example. Some jurisdictions, like in this example, Malta, allow to give interest-free loans uh, to affiliates. And, and in this case, Malta gives an interest-free loan to Luxembourg. And Luxembourg, under its domestic law, allows the Luxembourg company to act as if it has made an arm's length um, interest payment to Malta. So basically a transfer pricing adjustment. And that's something that's just plainly not covered in, in, in a tattoo because it's not an, a hybrid structure. Um, and, and Luxembourg in its turn will, will give a loan to an affiliate, in this case, the US company. So from a, a Luxembourg perspective, you have a small spread between the uh, interest received and the deemed deduction on the um, on the loan from Malta, and in Malta you have no pickup, and uh, yeah, you would say this is great, and you would get a deduction in the U.S. But Bruce, uh, yeah. tell us so, whether that works. Yeah, so so this is an example of where we need everybody at the table, both the foreign partners and the U.S. partners, and the right subject matter experts, because this does work, and this is a very common structure pre-U.S. tax reform that it runs straight into a 267 Cap A. We've got an imported mismatch problem because Finco or Luxco is getting a deemed interest expense payment for a payment it never made. If you're a foreign parent, it doesn't work. You flip this around to a U.S. multinational structure, and it does work. 
uh, some caveats, um, but it does work. So it's also dependent upon whether you're foreign parented or a U.S. multinational. So retrofitting structures for the new world, we've hit uh, what doesn't work. So here we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about what does work. Uh, IP onshoring, where you've got appropriate DEMPI functions, of course, works. U.S. master DISTIs, which is really making the U.S. principal, whether it owns the IP or not, to generate foreign sourced income, take advantage of FIDI, put the foreign IP in the U.S. and the U.S. IP offshore, et cetera. Replacement structures for DREs because of the new ATAD2 rules. Um, and then also replacement structures for financing. Um, you'll, you will have U.S. parented financing structures, and we do have replacement structures with financing branches that are real and have people and have substance. All right, um, let's wrap it up. Um, this concludes part two of our introductory session. So hopefully through these two sessions, you clearly understand what the drivers of change are and what the heads of tax are wrestling with. I hope as well, uh, you'll be able to recognize the um, uh, potential vulnerable structures out there. I won't go through them. We've hit them extensively during this discussion.